Hi, good evening, everybody from Tel Aviv. Good evening to everybody from Toronto and Portland, Oregon and Belgrade and Sarasota and um, many other places, I'm sure. Uh, we'll get going in just a minute or two. Let a couple more people catch in and be respectful to those of you who are already here. 8 p.m. Tel Aviv time. My name is Jay Shofet, Direct Partnerships and Development at SPNI here in Israel. Uh, coming to you uh, for a change, not with Lawrence Kazmir, but with Avi Sadiv, our Executive Director in our Toronto office, Canadian SPNI. Avi, uh, welcome to our uh, back office and thank you so much for hosting us and, uh, and uh, allowing this webinar to go forward. Uh, We'll introduce Professor Avital Gazid in just a moment. Um, people are still joining from various places. Avi in Toronto, I'm in uh, Tel Aviv and Professor Gazid, I'm not sure where he's from or where he's living. I'm from Kadima, which is oh. near Ranana, the center of the country. Kadima Tsoran. Kadima Tsoran, you're right. We had to uh, we had to put a bunch of uh, municipalities together uh, many years ago to save money and be more efficient in our municipal work. Hasn't happened since then, but it's been done also with uh, Tsuri Gal Kochavia. Yeah, Modi'in Maccabi Murut. <laughs> That's a triple. Yeah, three for the price of one. It yeah. saved a lot in municipal uh, services. Okay, well, I think we're uh, we're pretty much ready to go here. A couple minutes after the hour. Welcome from Tenafly, from Northern California, from DC, from Potomac, from Northern Israel, from all over, from Arad, from Cape Cod, one of my favorite places in the world. Uh, keep coming in, keep your messages coming. And uh, of course you can use the chat feature and uh, questions and answers, and we'll try to get you answers throughout uh, throughout the talk tonight. But my name is Jay Shofit, Director of Partnerships and Development of SPNI. Avi Sadiv is with us in the background uh, running the show, and uh, we are very, very uh, happy to be introducing tonight uh, Professor Avital Gazit, a member of the uh, Board of Directors of SPNI here in Israel, and a professor of Zoology, uh, Life Sciences, Environmental Studies at the Tel Aviv University, Porter School of Environmental Studies, uh, an expert on uh, endangered ecosystems, uh, wetlands, winter pools, amphibians and reptiles and the critters that live in them. It's gonna be a fascinating talk on a subject that I think receives too little, uh, too little focus here uh, in Israel and probably worldwide. Um, before we get started, I just wanna thank uh, our supporters around the world, our volunteers in the States and in Canada and in the UK, uh, doing yeoman's work for us, volunteer work in New York, Toronto, and other points throughout Canada and North America, um, our hardworking skeletal staffs, uh, Avi in Toronto and uh, Michael uh, and Robin in New York. Thank you guys very much. Um, thank you, Avi, especially for uh, being our host tonight and uh, Away we go, Professor Gazid. I've just introduced, and uh, he will take us away with um, with uh, what I'm sure will be a fascinating talk and uh, 40, 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for some questions and answers. So, thank you very much, and uh, welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Jay. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Avital Gazid, and I am a, a retiree of the. Uh, Department of Zoology at Tel Aviv University, but I'm in a second run at the at Tel Aviv University heading the Environmental Studies Program, uh, Master Program. Uh, I'm an aquatic ecologist. I uh, did my master at Tel Aviv University and PhD at Madison, Wisconsin. So I have quite a bit uh, uh, background in what we call aquatic ecology. And I would like to share with you uh, my experience this time with rain pools, uh, which is uh, my, my favorite site since I was a kid. I remember collecting tadpoles and bringing it home and uh, raising them and learning, 
learning about their biology. So let's start. Okay. Uh, now, uh, rain pools in most cases are considered uh, a non resource system, meaning it's not something important. It is good for frogs, for toads, and maybe mosquitoes. Uh, but you will learn uh, in a little while that mosquitoes are not inhabiting this uh, rain pool, healthy rain pools. Um, and actually, what I found that this is the aquatic Cinderella. You look at this turbid water, and I think you would not realize that it's so rich in uh, different organisms. And I would like to show you today just a little bit of this world. So the lecture, lecture topics will be rain pool is a unique aquatic ecosystem, uh, its unique biodiversity, and now something very interesting, I think, to all of us, do parents always know what is best for their offspring? And then finally, rain pools, revolution in Israel. So let's start with uh, what is a rain pool? Rain pool is a system of contrasting wetness condition. It uh, has or it contains water during winter and early spring, and it dries uh, up uh, during summer, and it must dry up for the, organ for the special organism to survive in it. So it undergoes seasonal wetting followed by seasonal desiccation, and therefore another term for rain pools is temporary ponds. Now, uh, something that we need all of us to understand that the term wetland is usually used as a general term for freshwater ecosystems. So a lake is a wetland and a stream is a wetland and a marsh is a wetland. So we are talking now about rain pools or temporary pond. And what is the difference between a marsh and a rain pool? Uh, uh, and a, a rain pool dries out completely, as I mentioned to you earlier, and a marsh uh, shrinks and the water, there is a drawdown of the water in the marsh, but it still contains water and may have, for instance, fish. In uh, rain pools, it's a fishless system. And this is a very important uh, characteristic of rain pools because fish are major predators and very efficient predators, actually, they are preying on everything that moves in the water. And here I'll show you, uh, um, this, is, this organism is a larva of a beetle, um, which is called swimming beetle, the Tiskide in, in uh, uh, the scientific name, and it's a voracious uh, larva, it has very strong uh, jaws, uh, but it preys one-on-one, uh, -on -one, not like fish that can eat uh, without hesitation, one after the other. Uh, this feeds one-on-one, -on -one, and therefore uh, the predation pressure in fishless system is usually low relative to lakes and other systems, perennial system that contain fish. And uh, this characteristic of rain pools enables the inhabitants to be relatively large uh, relative to their counterparts in perennial system, in system that contains water uh, the year round, uh, because they are not afraid of being uh, preyed upon by uh, fish, for instance. Now imagine a lion that needs to feed on, 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 a, a, on rodents, it will have to run after them and simply die, losing all its energy running after rodents it's not large enough to feed uh, uh, as a source of energy for the land. The same goes for all predators. And therefore, uh, if you don't have a efficient predator in the system, you can grow and be large without fearing of being preyed upon by a predator. Now here you see a dwarf king, kingfisher that <laughs> actually preying on this larva in a rain pool so you have a predator on a predator in this picture. This is from a rain pool. Now, another characteristic of rain pool that they are really rich in, in invertebrates, 
Uh, you will see in a minute what they are. Here you see a sample taken by, by a net and you see two types of organisms, the green ones, which are actually uh, looks like a clam. And this is a crustacean. Uh, they are called ostracods. And the red one is another crustacean, it's called copepod. And they are so abundant when you move a net through the water, you collect thousands of them. Now, uh, I will show you other invertebrates that are in rain pools. And if I go from left to right, you see a crustacean, which is called Daphnia, or in English, the water flea. You see snails. You see back swimmer bug. Uh, this is a, ma a major predator. Uh, one of the reasons that we don't find mosquitoes in rain pools is due to this organism that will immediately catch any uh, mosquito larva. And this is another bug. It's called the water boatman. Look at the legs. The hind legs are, uh, has a lot of hairs and they work like uh, an oar. And this is a beetle, the water scavenger, and uh, a, a flatworm, mayfly. And uh, the last one here is a larva. It's not, uh, it's not a worm. It's a larva of a mosquito, non-biting mosquito. We do have mosquitoes like that. They actually, all they do is reproduce and they don't feed as adult. And this is the larva. And on the, uh, on the left side to the larva, this is the egg that the uh, female laid in the water. And what one of the characteristics that you see that they are red. The reason that they are red is that they have the pigment hemoglobin that we have in our red blood cells. And in their case, it is uh, in their body, not in, in, um, in red blood cells, but just as a fluid in their body. And it allows them to live in water with very low oxygen. Now, I wonder if any of you can um, think what that is that we look at. Uh, just to give you a scale, all this, the length of this is 0.4 millimeter. It's really, really small. And what we are looking here is what we call resting eggs. Resting eggs, those are the one of the evolutionary uh, adaptation of organism, of crustaceans, especially living in rain pools, that they can stay uh, on the ground, dry, uh, not active as resting eggs. And then upon inundation and wetting, they hatch. Now, uh, OK, here you see the Daphnia that we saw before. And you, you see that in a special brood chamber, they develop the resting egg. You see a resting egg here. And you see one starting to develop in this brood chamber, another, um, another uh, brood chamber with, with an egg, resting egg. So when this uh, crustacean will die, the eggs will fall into, uh, into the water and will stay there the entire summer and only hatch uh, following the first filling of the pond. Now, the, uh, the resting eggs, it's interesting. They are structurally resemble the sweet Kinder Joy. I don't know if you all of, know, all of you know, but the kids uh, in different places in Sato in Israel know what a Kinder Joy is. And uh, when you open it, you see that they, it has a shell and two eggs inside, as we saw previously. If I go backward, you see? It is very similar. These are the eggs, and this is the shell covering the eggs. So uh, it just structurally it resembles the Kinder Joy. Now, the, the magic of evolution is that resting eggs resembles very much seeds of desert plants. Both need to adapt to situation uh, where you have a long dry period and then relatively short wet period. And not always there is enough water to complete the life cycle. So uh, both respond to survival under alternating conditions of wetness and desiccation. 
and they have the following uh, characteristic. They resemble structurally having protective shell over the embryo. Bones can remain intact over long dry periods in resting eggs can stay intact for 20, 30 years uh, in, on, uh, on the ground. Both sprout, if it's a plant or hatch, if it's a crustacean upon wetting, and both have a special mechanism of delays sprouting hatching. Uh, what it means is since uh, there is uncertainty if the, the, this year will be a rainy year, will be enough water to complete the life cycle. If all the eggs will hatch at one time and it was a bad year, this species is gone, it's lost. But what, uh, they, what they actually do is only part of the eggs will hatch in the first year, some in the second year and some in the third year. And they do it by the difference in the thickness of the shell and some of the uh, mechanism inside the eggs. So this is a very important mechanism which both seeds and the eggs, the resting eggs share. Now I would like you to look at this picture and may not look nice to you and may look like a scum, but it is not. So let's look closer, go closer and look what it is. And this is picture taking close and what you see here first of all that this is a woody debris floating on the surface and here you can recognize the resting eggs floating this is after inundation the first inundation of the pond the plant uh, debris which is dry is floating and so uh, uh, do the uh, the eggs so the rest egg floating with plant debris following inundation now uh, this crustacean that you see ha uh, here are uh, the typical rain pool crustacean. If you see all of them or even one of them in a pond, you, you can be sure that this is a rain pool, meaning a pool that will dry, will have a dry period and, then, and a wet period. The first one that on top, uh, uh, on, on top right is a fairy shrimp and uh, it swims on its back, has many legs, which serve three, uh, for three uh, purposes. One for swimming, the other one is for uh, taking oxygen from the water, and the third one for feeding. It simply filters the particles from the water and uh, brings them to the mouth. The lower one, is clam shrimp, it actually looks like a clam. And again, you can guess now that the red color is hemoglobin, which allows the species to survive near the ground where the oxygen is very low. And the, um, on the left side are tadpole shrimps, two different uh, species. You can see that uh, one has a scale between the, these two we call this churchy, these two uh, long hair-like structures, and this one doesn't have. These are two different uh, uh, genera, actually. Uh, uh, they are large. This is two centimeters, this is one centimeters, and this can reach five centimeters. We, and the reason is that they survive or live in a system without a major predator such as a fish. Okay, um, now feminism, uh, as we know in our culture, is not a human invention. Actually, it's found in nature. And this is what I, I would like to show you. Again, we look at the crustacean Daphnia, and here you see a Daphnia carrying a resting eggs, and here a Daphnia with some uh, round structures, as you see here. You see them better in this Daphnia. Those are not resting eggs. Those are embryos that develop sp spontaneously without mating. Actually, the females produce females producing females without the need of mating uh, with a male. And they will do it for as many generations 
as it possible as long as the conditions in the pool is good. Once the temperature increases, the pool starts to dry up and uh, the concentration of the minerals uh, in the pool increases, then some of the uh, embryos will develop into males and they will uh, grow in the pond and mate with the females and produce the resting eggs. So female, females producing females without any involvement of a male is uh, found in nature. Now, uh, another, the, the adaptation to a rain pool is not only uh, characteristic of animals, it's also characteristic of plants. And I will show you just one example. Uh, the star Dam Damasonium uh, or Damasonium alisma is the Latin name. It start to grow uh, underwater, such as a, a grass. When it reaches the surface, the plants start to flatten and it becomes a floating plant. You, you can't even associate this with the grass-like uh, structure uh, that it just uh, was growing at the beginning. And then when the pond finally dries up, it straightens the leaves and becomes a terrestrial plant. And if you come at this time to the pond, you, you wouldn't even know that this was a plant that, that grew underwater, became a floating plant, and then a terrestrial one. It flowers and produces star-like fruit. And this is why it is called star damasonium. And this is typical clear adaptation to temporary water. So the adaptation to um, uh, wetness followed by desiccation is not only characteristic of animals, but also of plants. Now, uh, rain pools can be uh, very attractive as at least, <laughs> you know, it's, it's in my opinion, when you look at this pond, you don't really know what that is, but let's go and see it closer. It may look like a snow on the pond, but it, it is not. Now, when you go closer, you see this plant. It is a beautiful plant called Vernunculus or white water uh, crowfoot, a beautiful plant. So uh, in, many, in many cases, the rain pools are turbid. Uh, the water is not clear, but it, this is uh, uh, floating particles in the water. It's not that the, the pool is dirty or polluted. It's simply particles that are flowing in the water. Sometimes the pools are clear, this one, Nihalim uh, rain pool is a clear pond, and this ranunculus uh, develops and covers the entire pond. Uh, it's a beautiful view. Now, I don't have time to show you more about uh, vegetation. I won't have much time to show you about birds uh, either. Uh, there are many, many birds that use rain pools, ducks of many uh, species. And here you see the ibis. Uh, this is a, a heaven for many, many birds. And maybe in another lecture, we'll talk about the birds. Neither will talk about uh, uh, the uh, snakes uh, or the uh, terrapins, the, the turtles. Um, here you see the grass snake. It's not venomous snake. It has another uh, plan of uh, letting, letting you know not to get close to him. It excrete a very bad smell. So you don't want to hold him uh, for long because it will really, uh, your hand will be covered with this material, which is unpleasant. And this is uh, uh, a turtle um, living in the pond actually they are, uh, they differ from, from most reptiles in that they reproduce in winter, in cold temperature. Lizards usually uh, breed in, in spring and summer, but they uh, breed in the rain pool uh, during winter. And here you see a young one uh, in the pond. 
I'm sorry that I can't elaborate more than that. Now let's go to amphibians that I was told to tell you a little bit about amphibians. Now, uh, amphibians are species that mostly use the rain pools for breeding. They, they, most of them don't live in the rain pool or even in, in perennial ponds or the, the year round, they simply use it for reproduction. And one thing we have to say about amphibians in general, all over the world, they are, we are facing amphibian decline and uh, their decline is severest of all, of all vertebrates. If you compare threatened uh, species uh, in percent, amphibians is 33%, mammals 20, 23%, uh, threatened and birds 12. Uh, and if we look on recent data uh, in 1990, this is the 122 species of amphibians disappeared. So actually it's a threatened, uh, threatened, uh, threatened uh, group. A uh, high percent of the uh, decline of amphibians is unexplained. And the Yosemite Park National Park is one of the example why they disappear there. I'll give you one example in our case that we think we know what happens. Okay, Israel is a semi-arid country and we don't have many uh, amphibians actually until the 1950s, we had seven amphibians known from Israel, but since 19, the, the mid 1950s, one species disappeared for more than 55 years and was considered globally uh, by the expert as extinct. But uh, here, I just will show you what we have here is green toad, tree frog, uh, stream frog, spade foot toad, a very interesting frog that is buried under the ground. And then we have, those are tailless um, uh, amphibians and the salamander uh, here and uh, bended newt that also, uh, they both look like lizard, but they are not, they are amphibians. Now uh, in uh, November, of 2011, we had a major discovery. The hula painted frog that was, uh, that only three um, specimens were found in the 50s, um, and then it disappeared and thought to be extinct, was rediscovered just by chance. And uh, just to tell you that this species can be considered as a living fossil, meaning it is, it is, it looks like a fossil, but it's, it's living. Now, uh, it is the only species in the genus that, uh, uh, and one of only 12 species in the entire family. And it diverged from all amphibians 150 mil, million years ago. So this, line that diverged from all other amphibians 150 million years ago. This is why you consi we consider it as a living fossil. And uh, it's called Latonia nigri venter, nigri means uh, black, black, uh, black belly, and the dots are typical. So this was uh, something, a major finding uh, and all scientists associated with amphibians uh, research uh, were just uh, amazed by this finding and are very happy now there is a research by Professor Gaffney, a former master and student of mine, a PhD student of mine, who is now carrying the research on the uh, Latonia nigri venter or the hula painted for hula is the hula marsh where this uh, species was found. Now, uh, I won't be able to go on all the, on the life cycle of all the different species. So let's look at the green toad. They are in mating in the pond and the, uh, uh, the female release 
from the two ovaries two strings of eggs and they wrap it around with the vegetation in the pond as you see here uh, the strings can be 10 meters long and may have 10,000 eggs here you see the eggs in the string now after depends on the temperature uh if winter temperature let's say 10 degrees it will take about 10 days uh, to two weeks and the embryos um, cut their way from the string you know you see the windows the hollow windows that with enzymes they simply dissolve and the embryos are now out of the string and they develop into tadpoles and finally the tadpoles develop legs first the hind legs and then the front legs and, and finally become what we call a metamorph or a small uh, uh, tadpole in this case it's it's the spade foot toad the young of state foot toad because this was a picture that i like you could see still the remains of the tail and uh, they absorb the tail they don't lose it they absorb the tail and uh, they become a small uh toad or a frog now the life cycle of of uh, the green toad usually takes about 12 weeks or three months and therefore uh in order for a pond to be uh, to produce a population viable population of green toad it should at least hold the water for three months or a little more we call this period hydro period, the period that the water is staying in the pool. Now, some of us really care for amphibians and they don't know why, and I'd like to give you uh, an explanation, possible explanation, why we do care for amphibians. And you see here in some places, they're already closed for, because um, amphibians are, or toads are migrating uh, there's a sign for the vehicles to be careful, 100 yards of crossing, uh, help a toad across the road so they won't be uh, smashed by the uh, car, and slow frogs and toads are crossing. Uh, this in civilized countries, you may see those signs. Now, why do we care uh, for amphibians? Um, I will offer you an explanation that perhaps it is embedded in our DNA. And you may ask, how come in our DNA? Now, this is the, our evolution. And I'm asking you, is this the only option? I'll give you, I would like to give you an alternative. Look here, I'll hold it for a few minutes. And an alternative evolution of human from frog or a toad this is of course a joke i'm not trying to seriously say that uh, we developed directly from frogs um, but uh, i'm happy that there are people who care for organisms that may be helpless in certain situations such as crossing our roads now there is so much uh, to tell you about the amphibians and I'll just want to give you an example. It is the way of hugging to promote mating important? You know, they, they mate, you saw that the male is holding the female. Is, this, is it important uh, how the male is holding the, the female? Now let's see the uh, toad. The toad is holding the female in the armpit. It's the armpit holding. And they can be on land for several days before they enter the water. And then the female releases the string, two strings from two ovaries, and the male releases sperm into the water. So, it, so it's uh, the fertilization is in the water. It's not internal fertilization, it's external fertilization of the eggs. Now the spade foot toad is, has a waist holding of the female. Here you see a male holding the female. Um, this is the natural uh, situation. Now, what happens if there is a mistake in species identification? And this is what I took a picture 
where a toad is trying to mate with a spade foot toad. And she is probably trying to scream, get off my back. And she doesn't know what this male is <laughs> wanting from her. Certainly there will be no uh, fruitful mating in this situation. But once we look at this picture, I'd like to turn your attention to the eyes. Look, this is horizontal eye and this is vertical eye. This is like cats, uh, uh, vertical eye and the spade foot toad sometimes is called the cat uh, frog, cat eye frog because of the, um, the eye position. And this is a simple way of distinguishing if you don't know, if you see the, the female of the two species look alike, but you, if you look at the eye, you see horizontal, it must be the green toad. If it's horizontal, this is the um, spade foot toad. Now, uh, we are getting close to, to the end and uh, I'd like to share with you my experience with uh, do parents always know best what is good for their offspring. Now, in the last two, two decades in Israel, the population of the green po uh, toad declined. This is also related to what I mentioned to you of amphibian decline globally. And we didn't know why. Uh, why are they declining? So what successful reduction requires? Uh, to be successful, that there must be recruitment of sufficient offspring uh, to the population to replace the dead one and to increase the population. Uh, so putting the eggs in the proper incubator, in this case, the, the pond is the incubator, is extremely important. Now, what is the proper incubator for amphibians? Uh, they need shallow water, they need vegetation in the water so they can wrap the uh, egg string. A string. Uh, they, need, they need good uh, water quality, and this is rainwater, and they need that the water stay in the pond long enough. So the either period is at least three to four months. The spade foot toad need, needs four months, so this is why I wrote here four months. Now for breeding, the toad is looking for shallow, warm water with live or dead vegetation to wrap the egg strings around as you see in this picture. Now, what you see here is a collie produced by a tractor that was uh, moving along this road and uh, water accumulated uh, in winter in this uh, collie. Uh, you can't see here, but there is an X-string. You will see it in a minute. This is the X-string. And the uh, toad made a mistake because it was shallow, it was warm. Shallow water are warmer than deeper water. And you see here another string. So what it means that uh, uh, amphibians not necessarily can choose the right incubator for their offspring. So can amphibian choose the right breeding site? Uh, yes, for shallow and warm water, no for hydropyr. There is no way they can sense shallow from deep situation. Now, why is it? And the reason is as shown in this picture. Here you see a deep pond, here you see a shallow pond. Both produce shallow situations uh, which are perfect for breeding of the, uh, of the toad. And therefore, this one with a long hydro period is not equal to this one with a short hydro period that may dry after a month or a month and a half or two months. And uh, if there are tadpoles that develop, they will all die. So th this we call an ecological trap. Ecological trap means that if the uh, toad has uh, two situations, a deep pond and a shallow pond. And it chooses the shallow pond because for, for him or for, for the uh, couple, the shallow situation in both cases seems similar. The shallow pond becomes a trap. 
So we call this a sink, meaning it doesn't produce enough offspring. And the deep one is a source, meaning it can produce a lot of uh, young ones that will join and be recruited to the population. Now, this is a source pond and this is a sink. And the question is where to go here or there. And we already saw that the toads, unfortunately, uh, are not able to choose the right place from the bad place. And this will be reproductive waste and this will be reproductive potential is fully materialized. Now, what we do, and this is our blame, that we produce more and more sinks by uh, urbanization, by agriculture, and, and, and no situation that were not in the past. And, and uh, there are more, many more um, shallow ponds, and the frogs and toads lay their eggs here, and the eggs or the, the dead poles are lost. And here I'll show you a situation. It's in, paren in, in, in quotation mark, so, so to speak, a suitable breeding site. It's very shallow. And this is the picture we saw before. The uh, a toad uh, wrapped the strings in the very shallow water. And I ask your, I'm sorry that you see a very um, not pleasant picture with a mess of uh, dead, tadpoles in this situation. Now, uh, unfortunately, we find that the toads, not only the toads, other amphibians as well, uh, return to the same place where they lost all their eggs in previous year. They don't have a way of uh, judging that, that this uh, place was a bad one. Uh, we, we find a situation where uh, uh, females, or, or actually the couple, are moving to a place that was a rain pool, and now it's a parking uh, place, parking lot, and they are coming to the parking lot looking for, looking for the water that they uh, had a year uh, before. We call this philopatry. Philopatry meaning uh, that uh, uh, loving the place that uh, they used to breed before. So this is another reason where reproduction of amphibians fail. Now, the fate of rain pool is not only due to the inability of the amphibians to judge where the place is suitable or not suitable, but in many cases is due to us. This rain pool is very close to Tel Aviv University. I was teaching a course in rain pool and we used to walk from the lab to the, the spawn, stunning it from the very beginning to the end until one day I came and I saw, I saw the tractor uh, actually scraping the ground. You see the remains of the spawn. Uh, this is another stage. And this is now a major highway in, in Israel, Highway 20. Uh, so the system were considered at that time non-resource system, so who cares? Now, unfortunately, this is not anymore today. And what I show you here, it's inauguration ceremony. Uh, this Menachem is a senior representative of the Ministry of, Envir of the Environment, praising the achievement of the Leva Sharon Rainpool Park uh, uh, for digging this pond and um, actually reconstructing what was in the past and uh, what we have is rain pool revolution in Israel. I take the, uh, the blame for this revolution and I did it unintentionally. I worked on it for 40 years trying to protect rain pools. And finally, without really my intention, people started to understand that really this is a sourceful environment rich in organism and biodiversity. So this is one of the, uh, I don't think you have any place in the world where a rain pool was inaugurated. Actually, Israel is leading in this revolution in all the Middle East. 
Now, to show you how far it went, uh, we have a program in the army, in the Israeli uh, army, of officers take responsibility for the environment and they choose a topic of the environment and uh, from a fund the, that was contributed uh, to that, they get money to work with the soldier and clean the environment or do something for the environment. Here, the paratroopers unit, one of our best unit in the army, decided that they want a rain pool and they dug a rain pool. This is my uh, student now, um, uh, he is an architect and ecologist. He is now the specialist of constructing rain pools. Together, we help them to construct a small pool, but this is a, um, a good pool. And uh, it, the first year already, we had the Daphnia discrustation. And here you see that they have already resting eggs. And this was dug by the paratrooper unit in the area where they are going, going out for training. This is my best picture. This is another inauguration. We had many parties like this. It is my best picture because here you see a grandma with two grandchildren looking on organism collected from the pond that they are inaugurating. And you see other parents with their kids holding test tube looking for uh, the biodiversity in the pool. So I think we really achieved a very important goal of introducing rain pools to our society. If I didn't convince you enough, here you see the mayor of Tel Aviv uh, that is now running uh, for the pri uh, for pri to be the prime minister of Israel, uh, Huldai. And this is again my uh, former student showing him on another pond that was constructed. And what he was so impressed then he said to me, Professor Gazit, I hope the public will know how to protect this pond, which is uh, uh, so important. And this is the final picture. And uh, this is something that 40 years ago, when I started to protect the rainbows, I couldn't even imagine. What you see here, that, that it was a conference on urban nature. And this is the Tel Aviv architect. Uh, Starting up, uh, starting his um, PowerPoint presentation, and the first picture is a rain pool in uh, southern Tel Aviv. So rain pools are now a trademark. Thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you very much, Avital, Professor Gazit. Really excellent. Very, very interesting. Uh, we have lots of questions. I don't know, 20 or more probably. Okay, I will stop share. So maybe, I don't know if we can see the people. Exactly, that's fine. Thank you. Um, we'll, uh, I'll just kind of hear rapid fire questions and uh, many of them. Uh, oh, okay. I'll try to be brief, but I want to start with, people are asking about the name. Uh, it's funny because you have used the term rain pool throughout. Uh, you mentioned other names, but we've been calling it in our publications in English and SDNI, winter pools and uh, vernal pools. And people also asked about ephemeral pools, which is something different, correct? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the questions, for, uh, for this question. Now, actually vernal pools are pools that are uh, constructed or fill up from snow melt. So they are really, uh, there is snow and ice, and then uh, the ice and snow melt and you get a pool. This is usually a vernal pool. Okay. Rain pool, uh, uh, winter pool is uh, probably a good name, but in our case, it's winter, spring, and sometime, sometime early summer. So okay. perhaps the best one, best name would be a temporary pond. Temporary Tem pond really include all the situations. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, let me let me just quickly go through some questions and also have them on chats. Um, what does feeding one-on-one -on -one mean in one of your first ah, slides? Okay. What, wait a minute. Uh, uh, those of you who has aquarium with, with fish know that if you introduce live food in the aquarium, the fish will not stop feeding. They will fill their mouths and uh, take them sometime one-on-one, -on -one, but they will continue to feed. And actually, they will excrete 
almost undigestible uh, feces of the prey. Uh, this is not the case of the natural predators, of the invertebrate predators. They grab uh, uh, something and they will feed on it and rest and take another one. So the, the predation pressure is much lower than in a system that has fish. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Murray in Toronto wants to know, is the alternating wetness desiccation cycle the reason why wheat has large enough, with large enough kernels developed in the Middle East? And by this he wants to know, does the plant need to put its energy into the seed and little else? Uh, I'm not sure I, I understood the question. The question was that in alternating desiccation and wetness, is that the reason why wheat developed in the Middle East? Because that cycle is unique. Ah, the wheat, the wheat. Uh, no, there are many other plants that uh, uh, their seeds are able to uh, stand dryness. Uh, the desert, I took the desert seeds because they have the special characteristic of delayed sprouting, meaning they can uh, sprout under uh, different years. So if there is a bad one, and some of them started to grow and died without producing new seeds, nothing happened because next year there are still a stock of seeds that can grow. But many other plants have seeds that can withstand dryness. Okay, thanks. So a lot of people want to know, and I think you touched on this, but let's just be clear. How do snakes, turtles, amphibians, and clams survive the drought period? Uh, okay, now so, it's a very good question. Those that are what we call truly aquatic, meaning all their lives in the water, must have uh, uh, resting eggs that can withstand the, the dryness. Those that are able to move like insect, flying insect, like the water boatman, and others, they have wings. And when the pond dries up, they simply leave the pond to another water situation. They are opportunists. They use the pond as an opportunist. They can be in rain pools or temperate ponds and go to another pond. Now, the, the snakes and the turtle uh, also leave the pond when it dries to a, a wet situation. But some of the amphibians really dig into the ground and what we call there, they estivate. They are there for the entire summer. And when the rain resumes, then they are popping out of the ground and start their life first in the land or land to feed. And then when the break pool fill, they uh, breed in the pools. Interesting. Uh, my follow up to that quickly uh, is, so because some of them, the snakes and the turtles have to migrate to an actual perennial wetland, does that mean that a, by definition, a, a rain pool needs to be X, no further than X kilometers from a real wetland? Yes, or, or for them to be in a rain pool means that they need to have a refuge uh, uh, for the period that the, the pool is right. an so, active, well, An active rain pool, interesting. Okay, um, let's continue on. Uh, you talked about some plants and some people want to know how many of these plants are found in the U.S. I don't remember which plants you were referring to. At uh, that the uh, Damasonium, um, uh, the crowfoot uh, hmm. um, uh, plant. And uh, how many of these are found in the U.S.? Yes, and another question about plants is what's edible in the uh, plants and other things, the shrimp? What is edible to humans in the winter ponds? <laughs> Unfortunately, none of them really are edible. Um, and I, I don't have the answer of how many of them are in the U.S. Okay. Uh, but you have to go in the U.S. to the Mediterranean climate region like California. Uh, where they do have rain pools uh, and uh, vernal pools are also uh, temporary ponds, um, but they are usually there during the summer because in winter they are under ice and snow. Okay, um, this is a big question. You did re mention it as well, but I mean, we could devote a whole 
easily a few hours to it. Um, David Goldfarb writes, despite the flexibility of the RP organisms, can you share about the impact that you and others have observed by climate change on the ecosystem over the last few decades? Okay, this is a very, very interesting question that I'm working on. It. I'm working on the question, who is afraid of climate change? Meaning, who can benefit from climate change? And rain pools are one of the systems that, are, at least in Mediterranean climate, benefit from climate change because they are dependent on runoff. And in our situation, winter is going to be shorter and the periods or the, the chapters of rain, as we call it, are shorter, but much more intense. We do have storm, uh, storm uh, events with very strong showers, which meaning a lot of runoff and the ponds fill up very quickly and the hydra period is longer. So in terms of rain pools, the effect of climate change is not necessarily bad. Wow, very interesting. <laughs> okay. Very interesting. Um, is the European fire salamander threatened from fungus disease in Israel also? Ask okay. somebody, uh, Miroslav in Serbia, I believe. Yes, the, the, fungus, the fungus disease, I'm, I'm not aware of the, uh, necessarily of the salamander, but the uh, several, uh, the tailless annoyance, we call them, the frogs and the toads um, have been infected. Uh, we didn't find this fungus, fortunately, fungus in this in Israel, so we don't have a mass mortality of amphibians so, or uh, death of amphibians. So the decline of the toads that we saw was due to ecological traps and not for disease. Interesting. Interesting. Um, another question about the U.S. equivalency. We get a lot of that here, Avital. Um, do you, does the U.S. have an equivalent, do you know, to the ear of the mosquito larva? That they, I'm sure I didn't hear that they had an equivalent, a U.S. equivalent to the eater of the larvae of mosquitoes. Ah, they, they, uh, yes, in, in all temporary ponds, uh, there are uh, organisms that are, uh, that they are predators. And the reason that the mosquito larvae are preyed upon, actually the first, because they are sluggish. They are, they are black and very apparent to the predator and sluggish, so they are preyed upon first before they feed on Daphnia or other crustaceans. Okay. Um, about how many rain pools might there be in any given year in Israel? Hundreds? Yes, hundreds. There are more in the north, less in the center and the uh, mm -hmm. southern part of, the, of Israel in the next. Okay. Um, any risk to humans from rain pools, like the malaria bearing mosquitoes, or for example? Okay, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. The malaria uh, bearing mosquitoes require pure water. They are not uh, in, um, in polluted water. So in our polluted stream, we won't find these mosquitoes. Now in rain pools, the water is good, but uh, they face the predators. They, they, they don't let them grow there. So this is not, not uh, uh, a danger to people. And when we construct a pool, we put a fence around it, a shallow one, uh, about uh, 60 centimeters in height, uh, just to tell people this is a protected area and there is a uh, risk of drowning because uh, sometimes there is mud and for, for children, for young children, if they walk around, uh, they should be careful. Uh, fortunately, we didn't have any accidents so far, and it won't okay. be. so there is no danger for, danger from rain pools to people. Okay, good, good. A few more questions, and we're nearing the end, and we're pretty much close to the hour. So, but almost everybody's still with us. 150 people all together, more than that. Um, and a question also about: Is the improper removal of eggs a problem in Israel, as it is in some countries? for certain species. I believe he means turtles probably or other reptiles. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't think I followed you. <laughs> the removal, I'm sorry, I'm probably speaking too fast. The removal of eggs. Yes. Is, the, is, it, is the improper removal of eggs a problem in Israel also? Of, of reptiles? I assume he means reptile species, yes. Okay. Uh, yes, 
uh, it, it's, uh, it's unlawful and it's being uh, protected. I'm not aware that this is a major reason for decline of reptiles in Israel. Okay. Um, Rochelle asks, and uh, I think I learned this in high school, but we'll let you answer. What's the difference between a frog and a toad? Okay. Uh, both are amphibians. Both are tailless and they develop similarly. They even have similar tadpoles. The, the difference is that if you remember when you look, the toads had a rough skin and, and uh, the uh, frogs have a smooth skin. Now the rough skin of the toad is because they have a special glands that secrete uh, a fluid, whitish fluid that is not toxic, but it, it, it's unpleasant. If you touch your lips or eyes, uh, it will burn. Uh, it's called bufonin, and this is why the Latin name of the toad is bufo. They produce bufonin and their uh, skin is rough uh, with the glands that produce the bufonin. Interesting, okay. Um... Uh, are there any new amphibian diseases that have popped up in recent uh, years or decades? And what about the effect of pollution on uh, these pools? Okay. You mentioned actually how that helps. Uh, okay, yeah. diseases, the fungus disease is globally and it's uh, really destroyed major populations of amphibians, not in Israel, but elsewhere, mainly in South America. Some of them disappeared when I showed you the 122 species that have disappeared, uh, extinct, got extinct, many of them due to the disease, uh, the fungus, the fungal disease. Um, what was the other one? Um, and your question about... Um, uh, oh, pollution, how, how does pollution... pollution. Okay, uh, fortunately now with the revival of the, uh, and the revolution of rainbows in Israel, uh, both the reconstructed and the natural one uh, are protected because people are now aware that this is a system. It's not uh, uh, something that doesn't worth anything and they protect it. So um, uh, only if there is an accident, uh, otherwise rain poles will not be um, affected by pollution. The major uh, cause the, for Damaging rain pools is changing the drainage, the watershed, drainage, the drainage area to the pond by construction, by, by uh, agriculture, that changes the, the runoff to the ponds and they may dry up early because there is not enough water. Yes, okay, thank you. Listen, one final question, I think, and it relates to really some of the core work of SBNI and perhaps something that you have been um, involved with as your as a member of the board of SBNI, <clears throat> and that's the question of uh, can biologists or ecologists be consulted before construction in order to you know preserve and save these uh, these pools. And I know that our planners all around the country uh, deal with these issues in, in planning bodies. But how would you answer that question? Okay, uh, the SBNI is is really extremely involved in. Uh, in such a situation. Um, there is a sort of a dialogue between the planners and ecologists. Uh, it's not sufficient because uh, sometimes they uh, don't know enough. And um, we, for instance, uh, when we ask to do uh, uh, an overview of a certain area, is it important? Is it ecologically sensitive? And we say, well, we the ecologists, they blame my, our colleagues. And we say, look, there are no uh, special species of plant and animals, and this uh, stream was polluted. And if we end up here, this is what the planners are really looking for, because if the system is not that important, they can plan anything they wish. What I require from all, our, from all ecologists is not only to look at the, um, uh, deterioration of the system, 
but the potential for rehabilitation. So if we have a polluted area and there is a good potential for, for rehabilitation, this is the message, message that we should transfer to the planners. Interesting. And I did miss a couple of questions. I was, it was pointed out to me. Uh, thank you, uh, Avi or Lawrence, who's ever back there. I guess that's Avi. Um, how many species of turtles are there in Israel? How many species of? Of turtles. Oh, of turtles? Uh, well, there are land turtles that are uh, five, if, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, in the uh, aquatic system, there is only one. Okay. There are sea tur turtles, but, but freshwater is only one. Okay. And um, so the final question, uh, and, I'm, and I'm not sure you can answer it, but the Jerusalem Bird Observatory, uh, it's watered by, it has a pool, and it's watered by a waterfall and by rain. Is that also a rain pool as, that we're talking about? Do you know? No. So if, if, if the water is there uh, uh, constantly, it's a perennial system, and the organism that I showed you will not be able to survive there. They must have a dry period. Okay. Well, the only thing, um, how, do, how, do, how do crustaceans get into newly constructed rain pools? Oh, this is wonderful. Um, one of the vectors are birds. The ducks, they land on one pool and you saw the uh, resting eggs floating up to the surface. Then mm. the duck is moving to another pond. And you saw that the, the, uh, the paratroopers uh, dug a pond and the first year without really doing anything, uh, we found the Daphnia there because um, it was brought by birds. Not only that, our forefathers in Israel used to herd their goats and cattle from one pond to the other as long as it had water for drinking and for the vegetation around in the moist uh, soil. So the, um, the goats and the cattle carry on their legs the resting eggs and move it from one place to from one pond to the other. Wow, very interesting. Well, thank you very much. There are hundreds of comments here. Well, at least dozens thanking you and saying what an excellent, great presentation it was. Uh, I agree. Uh, you're a very good presenter, and I would like to uh, get your uh, commitment now to come back and talk about snakes and turtles. People are asking. Uh, and this is, um, not, this is not my specialty, but I can talk to you about the impact of climate change on Lake Kinneret, on lakes. This I can. Very interesting. And I, we can talk also, I'm thinking maybe to have you talk about your role as a member of the board and um, some, okay. some broader issues of SBNI. Oh, okay. So, uh, we will, uh, we'll be continuing these webinars every every two weeks, so we'll be in touch with you. I want to thank you very much, Professor Kazit. Avi, thank you so much. Avi Sadiv in Toronto. Thanks to our board and our supporters around boards in, uh, in the States and Canada uh, and in the UK our, uh, and in France, our supporters around the world and in Israel. Um, thanks very much to Lawrence uh, back in the back, in the back of the back office. Uh, a promo for two weeks from today, Sunday the uh, 24th, uh, we'll be having a special webinar about the afforestation policy. That is a special webinar for Tu uh, Typically, we're told to plant trees in Israel. SPNI wonders whether that, in fact, uh, whether there's any need for further afforestation in Israel. Uh, we'll be talking to Noah Yayon. She's a, a lawyer who works at SPNI internally. Uh, she's uh, been involved, involved in court cases uh, stopping uh, the uh, Jewish National Fund and uh, the uh, State of Israel from uh, planting forests in places they shouldn't have been planted. Instead, we'll be presenting our plan for mindful tree planting, planting the right trees in the right habitats for the right reasons, including in wetland habitats. We'll be talking about uh, Avital, our plan for converting um, failing fish ponds into uh, managed wetland nature reserves, so uh, and planting some trees in those places. Anyway, that'll be two weeks from today, same time, same channel. Uh, thank you all very much. Signing off from Tel Aviv. Thanks, Avital. Okay, I just want to thank all of you for joining. And it's really important that we will communicate um, on the uh, environmental issues.
Okay, thank you very much. Toda. Bye. Bye to all of you. Toda to everyone. Toda raba.